Welcome to um, the annual and sometimes semi-annual Space Up Houston um, commercial spaceflight panel. It's an opportunity for the general public and space enthusiasts to meet the, uh, the uh, giants in our trade and industry and, and find out how, um, how things are going with regard to uh, uh, commerce in space and how we're moving further out into space. And, and NASA itself is, is moving on to Mars and leaving this void behind us for commercial space flight to fill. Um, it's already working out extremely well with regard to um, uh, cargo, and so we're hoping very soon that we will be buying rides from domestic suppliers on a commercial basis from, uh, for astronauts up to the International Space Station. And that's kind of like what we're about tonight. We have uh, representatives of three of the industry with us. We have Boeing and SpaceX and Orbital all here to tell you about their um, their progress that they're making. And, uh, and then we'll open it up to questions. And we'll run, we were talking tonight about how long should the um, session run, and we'll run as long as there are um, reasonable questions. <laughs> or until they throw us out, or until we just get tired and we want to go have a beer or something. So um, I think what we'll do is we will just kind of go in, unless you guys have a preferred order, um, we'll just go in the order that I see you, all right? <laughs> Chris Ferguson is a former astronaut, works for Boeing, and he is going to introduce himself in three words, and then uh, he's up. Thanks. Welcome, Chris. Oh, good. <laughs> Lucky. Um, Friday. <laughs> Beer. All right. All right. All right. Uh, let's see. How's everybody doing today or this evening? Um, I'll, uh, I'll give you a little bit of insight to where Boeing is. I, I see some friendly faces in the audience, which is wonderful. So your job is to sort of root for Boeing, and you know, then you can, you can do what you want to the other competitors here. But uh, we'll, uh, some, of the, uh, some of what you're going to see is actually sort of like Snapchatable. All right, for those of you, you know, my, my teenage kids are sort of turning me into, you know, Snapchat fiends here. And, uh, you know, Snapchat's a great thing. You, um, it's, if you want to send somebody a picture of something, they get to look at it for 10 seconds and phew, then it goes away. So uh, take a good look at what you're going to see because you probably won't see this anywhere else. <laughs> um, all right, let's see here. All right, some of, it's, uh, some of it you may have seen before, a lot of it you haven't. Uh, first, let's just back up. Um, of course, uh, Boeing is one of the three companies right now that are all vying for this very interesting business that we have to commercially uh, transport U.S. astronauts and perhaps paying passengers to low Earth orbit. The, the, of course, the prime customer is the U.S. government, so we look upon them as, uh, you know, they're, uh, they're who we're working for. Uh, they, they subsidize our development costs, and uh, Boeing, you know, uh, they throw some in too. So Boeing's got skin in the game, and in the very end, uh, we hope that we have at least one and, you know, perhaps more uh, ways to commercially get, uh, get astronauts back and forth. Now, we've been doing this, you know, Garrett will, will tell you, up, you know, shortly, and, and I'm sure you're all well aware, we've been doing this for cargo or with cargo successfully for a couple of years now. So this is really just an extension, uh, and ultimately, what's the goal? The goal is to be able to allow the, the government to con, uh, continue on with that more challenging mission of going beyond low Earth orbit to an asteroid or Mars or back to the lunar surface or whatever our next destination might be. But the idea is that we should be good enough at this by now to get up to, to get back and forth to low Earth orbit and do it at a very reasonable cost. And uh, we won't talk a whole lot, of, a lot about cost, but you know, I, I looked back in history and what it said about the development cost of the space shuttle program. Of course, this is an, almost an apples to orange comparison, but 35 to 40 um, billion dollars to develop the space shuttle. Uh, and you can probably dispute what development really means, but uh, we're going to do that, of course, for less than an order of magnitude, less than that. So um, now, mind you, we're not taking up 50,000 pounds of payload at the same time, uh, but we are uh, cost effectively transporting people back and forth uh, to low Earth orbit. So everybody's got a video. I'll start with mine, and, uh, 
and then we'll, we'll go from there. I think some of the folks in this room might actually recognize themselves in this video. This is a Boeing like you have so. never seen before. Follow me this way. We want to get you up close and personal. This is the CST-100. We had a party CST one day and invited Fox and they, uh, they came down. It was actually a very, it was a great event. That's when the Dow was right around, you know, what is it, 15,000. It's one of our uh, parachute mortar tests we've been doing uh, over the course of the last few months. And then this is a, a individual parachute drop. Uh, we've done a, a couple drop tests of the full up vehicle, but now we're doing a lot of development tests just on the single parachute alone. And this, I believe, is done out at Yuma. Um, this is our launch, ab launch aboard engine. We had our third series of uh, tests with the launch aboard engine. We're sort of cheating. That really only fires for about five seconds. Um, but, uh, but we have four of those, and that'll get us off the, uh, off the stack. I know a lot of you are looking at this and saying that launch adapter is not right. You're right. It is not right. We wanted to hide it because it was sort of a secret what the real design was. I'm kidding about the secret thing. Uh, so uh, you know, with a little uh, with a little luck and uh, and uh, a lot of talented engineers, a lot like I said, a lot of whom are in this room, uh, we're going to be doing that hopefully uh, by uh, by mid 2017. Um, so uh, this is uh, sort of the Boeing bragging um, chart, if you will. You know, we've been in this business a long time, and it's really sort of interesting if you look back at the history of all the legacy, uh, the legacy companies that Boeing has, you know, acquired or, or uh, merged with over the years. But, of course, McDonnell Douglas, who built uh, the, the Mercury and the Gemini and the Space Shuttle, of course, were the prime contractor on the International Space Station. And, uh, you know, we go pretty deep in the commercial airplane business, too. It's amazing to me how large of a company it is. Uh, you know, Boeing's got enough back orders right now we could build airplanes for 10 years and not take another order so it's a it's a great time to be in the airline business uh, we we pump out uh, two and a half airliners per day uh, of a various uh, various makings of course the 787 is the newest one so uh, it's uh, it's neat to be a part of a large organization like this and w when I say large I mean we're large and we're very um, we're diverse geographically and we have a lot of different experience bases that we can draw on you'll see uh, we've done some work with uh, in uh, involving the, um, uh, the Boeing Sky Team. They're the ones who design the interior lighting for, uh, for commercial airliners. And we actually have a segment of them that are involved with sort of building up the interior of the vehicle so it doesn't sort of have that, that coarse military appearance. You know, we're going to try to make it look, uh, we're going to try to make it look good. Um, okay. Uh, just give you a real quick tour. Uh, off to the left, of course, uh, we're going to launch in the Atlas V. The Atlas V, I believe, is at 43 and counting. Uh, I haven't, um, I think that number's right, uh, but uh, we, I think there's 12 launches scheduled for that Atlas V this year, so they're sort of ramping up in, in a pretty good cruise mode. Uh, all of them uh, successful insertions into orbit and mission successes. Um, the, uh, you know, the X-37 is also a Boeing product, which I think is kind of cool. And uh, I don't think, I think the one that's up there has been up there for over a year now. It has not landed, right? Yeah, over a year. So, uh, and nobody says where it is, but hopefully someday it shows back up on Earth. Um, the, uh, of course, uh, part of what we're going to launch on uh, one of the launch complexes, Complex 41, uh, which, uh, of course, launches the Atlases out at the Kennedy Space Center, or Cape Canaveral. And uh, that doesn't have a crew access tower right now. We're going to have to build the infrastructure there to be able to get the crew up to the vehicle. Right now, they just roll the vehicles out. They never access the, the payload at the top, and they shoot it. So uh, we have obviously have to, we can't roll the crew out there 24 hours in advance, so we're going to have to find a way to get them up there. And that's roughly what it looks like. Um, the spacecraft itself, when I talk about the spacecraft, I mean the crew module, right, the triangular Apollo-like looking thing, and then the service module, which has those it's four pods circumferentially around there. There are propellant pods. Um, but there's, a, there's a, not a whole lot of brand new technology in here. A lot of it's very proven, uh, high TRL technology readiness level. And uh, we're actually gearing up here for, uh, for a pretty significant milestone. It's our critical design review coming up in July of this year. And we're actually, 
in the midst of an awful lot of subsystem uh, critical design reviews. We just did our instrument and control panel uh, Tuesday this week and uh, next week, or should I say come, next week is avionics. And then the week after that, we have uh, our airbag landing system, CDR, uh, up with our contractor in Dover. Uh, that's uh, ILC Dover. Uh, let's see, off to the right, um, you know, an interesting aspect of the, uh, the way Boeing has elected to move is to uh, contract back with Mission Operations Directorate right here in Houston. So they're going to be our uh, operations agent. Uh, they're just finishing up uh, the sort of the follow-on uh, control center architecture to, uh, to that that was used for the space shuttle program. It's called uh, MCC-21. And uh, that is the actual, for those of you familiar, the blue ficker, the old space station control room, uh, what it looks like in the MCC-21 config. So either that one or the white ficker, which is the larger shuttle one, will be, uh, will be our control room. We're not quite sure yet. And then in the bottom, uh, of course, uh, everybody has to have a footprint out at the Kennedy Space Center um, to, to do their processing. We will, uh, some of you may recognize, that's OPF3, Orbiter Processing Facility Number 3, which actually originated out at Vandenberg Air Force Base, was moved out here after the Challenger accident, uh, served uh, as a shuttle processing building for many, many years. That's the shuttle part on the left, and then it was also, they built an engine shop, so the space shuttle's main engines were serviced in the right-hand side. So. Space Florida, which is the entity that is sort of disposing of a lot of the unused shuttle astronauts in, uh, astronauts, yeah, those two. <laughs> that must be a Freudian slip. But they're, they're, uh, they're, they're disposing of a lot of the space equipment that was used for the shuttle program. I took possession of, um, of OPF-3 and, uh, and Boeing is uh, leasing it back from them. Uh, we're going to call it the C-3PF, or oh, I don't even know what C-3PF stands for. I think it's uh, CST-100 Command and Control. And, uh, anyhow, that's where we're going to basically build our vehicle. Uh, the crew modules will be built in the left-hand side where the orbiter processing building was, and the uh, service modules will be built on the right-hand side where the engine shop was. And I was in there uh, just a couple weeks ago, and uh, it's a shadow of its former self. Garrett, have you been back to see the OPF since they tore the guts out of them? Yeah, you, yeah it'll, it'll break your heart. But uh, anyhow, it used to have this incredible infrastructure that, we, that just enveloped the shuttle when it was in there, and it's all just disassembled and removed. And it looks like, um, my analogy was, it looks like an old New York subway station now. Okay. So, uh, but, uh, but Space Florida will come in, they'll gut that, and they're going to refurbish a lot of it uh, to you know, get it up to another state-of-the-art construction facility. Uh, sort of the way the inside of the, the, the craft looks, uh, we can carry up to seven, but we're going to carry five for the NASA mission. Actually, four is what NASA is looking for. We have that extra seat that we can either take a paying passenger on if the space station lets us, uh, or, uh, or we can load cargo in that as well. Uh, we have a clamshell design, uh, the top and the bottom. We call it the upper dome and the lower dome. There's actually no welds in that. There's one flange connection uh, around the middle. We don't intend to ever separate the halves after we build them. Oh, by the way, these are good for 10 missions, but if we have to, we can take them apart. Um, we, we all have a requirement to carry what's called a glacier, which is a freezer, um, and uh, you, you can sign it, see how that's illustrated and how we're going to carry uh, our, our mid-deck locker-like uh, shapes in, uh, in, in the cargo area. In the lower left, um, some of the highlights, uh, let's see, ASIN cover comes off uh, to expose, actually it reduces weight, comes off to expose one of our cameras on ASIN. Uh, we have um, a monopropellant system for the crew module, so uh, sort of very, very Apollo-like, and then we have a bipropellant system in the service module. And a series of RCS thrusters, what we call OMAC engines or orbital maneuvering engines, um, and uh, they're higher thrust, about 1,500 pounds of thrust, and the RCS are a little bit lower in thrust. But there's a, an array of them uh, circumferentially around in these what we call four doghouse uh, compartments where, uh, where the jets are. We have a, a solar array that we recently added uh, to, uh, to accommodate a, a scope change that NASA gave us. They wanted us to stay uh, a little bit longer in space. So we added it up to about 77 hours, and we saw that it was going to take a solar array to help us through that. So we added it to the back. And then you see our four launch abort engines on the rear side. Uh, Tom, you should recognize this. This is uh, the Tom Muller chart. Um, we'll just start at the lower left, and I think this is, should be pretty straightforward. Pad operations, right? We roll out about 24 hours prior to launch. Space shuttle hung out at the pad for about 30 days. So uh, this is going to be a pretty quick operation. This is the way ULA, uh, who is the, uh, the prime contractor, this is the way they like to operate. Roll them and shoot them, and uh, we're going we're gonna to fit right in, their, uh, right in their, their normal processing flow. Head up to the space station. Ideally, we dock on flight day one, but uh, we can dock as late as flight day two, maybe even flight day three if need be. Uh, spend up to two and a, uh, 210 days aboard, 
and then uh, and then uh, undock and land within six hours at uh, one of the landing land landing sites, uh, several of which we're surveying right now, and I'll show you shortly. Of course, uh, we are a land landing, which is sort of unique for uh, um, for the type of craft this is. You know, we're used to parachutes mostly coming down in the water with crewed vehicles, but uh, we're going to go for a land landing, which was the way Orion really started. And then Orion just sort of bulked up so much that it became impractical to do a land landing, and they went to a water landing. But we, uh, we've actually leveraged a lot of the technology from the airbags that Orion had, uh, had started to develop, and uh, the same company's building them for us. Uh, yeah, the obligatory, we've done all this chart, but uh, we're, we're near the end of the third phase. This is what's called CCI cap, right? Uh, improved capability, I believe, is what the I stands for. And then the next phase, uh, this is the last phase of what's, uh, what's been done under a Space Act agreement. The next phase will be done under a standard uh, federal acquisition uh, base contract, and, and we're just cleaning up the end. We just finished a pilot in the loop demo, and I'll show you a little bit more about that. Um, nothing here really worth talking about a whole lot. You see our, our craft in the water. Uh, again, we're designed to land on land, but since we launch over water and we have an abort system, we have to be able to negotiate the water so, uh, so we can land in the water as well if we have to. Um, in the middle, off, off to the left, uh, a lot of wind tunnel work. As a matter of fact, we are back in the wind tunnel right now as we speak up in St. Louis in what's called the, uh, the polysonic wind tunnel. Uh, looking at some of, um, you know, trying to hone down some of the instabilities that we see uh, with our ascent stack. That's, so that's the spacecraft on top of the, uh, on top of the launcher. Uh, let's see, it's probably all worth mentioning there. What else do we have here? Um, on the left in the upper side, you see uh, we just finished up one of, our, um, one of our milestones. And that's a, you know, can I put the pilot in there? Can he actually fly using the real jet models, using the real flight software and uh, using our real displays. And uh, that was, a, a, I think, a real good demo for NASA. And uh, of course, we were, we, my particular organization was very much, uh, much involved in that. So it was a lot of fun for us. I talked a little bit about the Boeing Sky Lighting Team. And uh, we've had a lot, of, uh, a lot of help by the human factors folks. And you can see that on the left. You see the vertical integration facility on the, the lower left there. Uh, that's, uh, that's, of course, the, bu the building that's existed out there for Atlas Stacking ever since the um, the EELV program uh, began about 10 years ago, and uh, what our vehicle will look like on the inside. And uh, again, some human factors work, and some of our team demonstrating our, one of our milestones. Yeah, I mentioned our landing sites. I, you know, I throw them up here just so everybody sort of gets an idea of, uh, you know, there's a lot of things. It's, it's really incredible what has to, uh, the, everything has to come together to find a good landing site out there. You know, you need, uh, you need a lot of flat area. Um, and it's got to be about uh, about eight kilometers in diameter, and it has to also uh, help you out orbital with, with orbital mechanics. You need them so you don't have overlapping sites. You want to be able to go ascending and descending. And uh, you know we've got some great members of our team here who have really defined this. And now uh, it's just a matter of negotiating uh, deals and, and memorandums to uh, you know to get these facilities on board so they know that. And it's very interesting. I mean, you, you get to do a lot of fun things in this business, but one of the funner things is to call someone up and tell them you want to land a spaceship in their dry lake bed. Um, <laughs> they usually kind of chuckle at you a little bit, and then they realize you're serious, and they're, they're very interested. Uh, you know, there's a couple, there's a small one on there. Uh, you, you see, it's, uh, it's called Wilcox, and it's really in the middle of nowhere in, in Arizona. And uh, it's one of the few facilities that really is in civilian. It's not in a federal airspace, or it's not, in a, um, it's not on a federal range. And, and they're the ones I think were the most incredulous that we wanted to do it. But now they're our best friends. They can't wait. They love when we come back to town and they want us to be a part of their future. So we're trying to oblige them. I, I inserted this just to give you an idea of, you know, sort of some of the things you wrestle with and, and what our vehicle looks like on the bottom. Of course, this is what we're going to land on. Uh, this is our airbag system. And, uh, you know, one of the very interesting facets of this is that center bag. I'll spare you all the details, but we found that recently we had to add it mostly to uh, allow for a water landing. We're landing in the water and we're getting this water geyser effect that came up between all the bags and it actually, it was a structural implication on the lower dome, so we added that in. And I, you know, I put landing site development. Yes, this is what we're doing for landing site development. We're just looking for, <laughs> for big, uh, big empty fields out there. So if you've got an extra, you know, uh, 16 square miles with a dry lake bed on it somewhere in the western United States that happens to fit under one of our orbital tracks, come talk to me afterwards and we'll make a deal with you. So that's all I had. Um, thanks. You bet.
So I, um, I probably should have said that we'll do questions at the end after we've heard from each of the panelists. So next up is Garrett Reisman from SpaceX, and we'll, uh, we'll hear how they're doing. Thanks. Thank you. I was just going to email that last file to myself. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see, is this, is this it? That's good. <laughs> control what? Uh, you get a view and... <laughs> <laughs> uh, there we go. Okay, great. Thank you. So let's see, three words, I would go with uh, handsomer than Chris. <laughs> How's that? Um, so hopefully you haven't seen t uh, too much of this before. It's a, it's, there's a lot of rehash from presentations I've given before, but um, it's always good to get out and, and say hi to all the folks here in, in Houston. Um, but the whole day at JSC, having meetings and, and talking to folks, and uh, it's, it's, it's always uh, great to come back. So I wanted to give you just a little kind of a status briefing of where we're at. Obviously, we're working uh, on the same program as uh, Chris and the Boeing team on uh, NASA's CCI CAP program. And um, we are uh, also in competition for the next phase, which is TCAP, and that'll be announced um, sometime this September. So uh, I'm going to focus more. I, I can give you kind of a broader overview than that, though, and tell you a little bit more about what SpaceX is doing as a company. Starting out with our, with our vehicles, so we have a uh, Falcon 9 rocket, and uh, we have uh, the Falcon Heavy, which is in development. Uh, we anticipate the first flight of Falcon Heavy to be in 2015, and we uh, think that'll be off our, our, whoa, that jumped all the way to the last slide. How did that happen? It rotates around. It rotates around, what? Like it, instead of you go forward, then Okay. Nice. Uh, so, um, <clears throat> yeah. So um, Falcon Heavy, we anticipate first flight in uh, 2015, and that'll be off of our new pad, which is 39A, uh, the same pad that, that Chris and I launched off of in, in shuttle. That's now, uh, we're, we're currently finishing the, our negotiations for the lease for that pad. And um, then we have the Dragon spacecraft. Uh, you see a post splashdown up there and, and uh, being grabbed by the space station arm on, on the bottom right. So as far as uh, just some numbers, um, and prices, anybody who's interested in buying one will be, I'll be outside the door when you leave. Uh, you could, we'll take your order. Uh, we, we have a layaway plan. <laughs> Falcon 9 is going for uh, 56 and a half million if you want one. And uh, heavy, depending on how much you want to bring up to, G, uh, to Geo, is it predicted between, we're selling it right now actually, between 77.1 and 135 million. As far as what they can do, um, to 28.5, low Earth orbit, uh, we can throw about 30,000 pounds with the Falcon 9 and um, uh, about 100 and 117,000 pounds uh, with the heavy. And, um, and then you see the geo numbers down there at the bottom as well. So it's the flight heritage of Falcon 9, we, we, uh, this, this slide is actually out of date. These are the, the five flights of the original Falcon 9 version 1.0. And um, we've now upgraded the Falcon 9 uh, to the 1.1, and I'll talk about that in just a little bit. This is what it looks like with Dragon up on top, and uh, you see also the landing legs at the bottom, because we do intend to take the first stage and bring it back and use it again. Okay, here's the 1.1. So we, we uh, did a lot of upgrades to the Falcon 9, and we have this, it's, uh, we call it the 1.1 to make our, our commercial customers a little less nervous about uh, what kind of improvements we're making, but really it's, it's, uh, there's a lot of really big changes. Um, the, the, it, it's gone from one string of avionics to three strings. Uh, we need that for, for passing the fault tolerance requirements that NASA requires for crew missions. Uh, we've got a structural safety factor of 1.4, which is also a, a standard uh, historic uh, crew uh, uh, human rating requirement. And uh, we did a lot of work on the engines to increase the reliability as well as their performance. And we've launched it now three times. Uh, first launch was out of Vandenberg, down there, this is a sequential one, two, three, left to right. Uh, Vandenberg, and that was, uh, had payloads that went to low Earth orbit. 
the next two were both uh, geostationary satellites for communi communication satellites that went up to uh, geo orbit. And all three of those flights occurred in, I think, uh, uh, just about a three month period. So we're hitting the ground running and we want to start launching uh, at a rate of once a month. And ultimately what we're uh, planning to do is, is launch uh, 20, 20 rockets a year, 10 of those Falcon Heavies and 10 of those Falcon 9s. So, uh, uh, and the very next launch is only a couple weeks away and that's the next CRS launch, taking cargo up to the space station. That'll be uh, middle of next month. Let's see uh, a little bit about the business. Uh, we are privately owned. Uh, we've been in, in the black for about, I think now we're up to five years that we've been uh, revenue positive and uh, cash flow positive. We have over $3 billion in, in backlog orders and $5 billion in total orders to date, uh, including the ones we've flown already. Um, a very diverse customer base, a lot of U.S. government, a lot of commercial customers, and um, and we've we've sold a lot of our we, we sold a lot of rockets. We have a lot of rockets to launch, which is why we want to get to that pace of operations. Uh, customers include other governments. The U.S. government, of course, is our biggest customer, and um, and then several other commercial groups. That's the manifest. I won't bore you with that, but you see we have a, you see a, a, a bunch of those different customers up on there. So we're, we're over 3,500. I think we're getting uh, almost over 4,000 now. This slide's a little out of date. We're growing pretty, pretty fast. When I signed up, I was employee number uh, 1075. So, and that was three years ago. <laughs> so I'm now senior to about three quarters of the company, uh, which is pretty good. I, I get a better spot in line at the cafeteria, which is nice. <laughs> <laughs> in Hawthorne, we've got this big building, which is about a half a million square feet. But then we, got, we bought up a lot of outlying buildings as well. And so we're up to about a million square feet of uh, footprint in Hawthorne, which is our headquarters. It's also our factory. It's also where we do a lot of our testing, at least all of our non-reactive testing, because the people in L.A. get really mad when you make a lot of fire and smoke in the middle of the city. I don't know why. So we do it in Texas where nobody cares. Um, <laughs> we got about 1,000 acres up uh, around Waco uh, where we do all of our reactive testing. And we, we do test... Every, every one of our engines, not only the individual engines, uh, uh, but we also put them together as a stage. There you see uh, a, a Falcon 9 first stage. So we fire every, every engine and we fire every stage. Uh, and then we bring it down to the launch pad and we do a static fire, so we fire it again. And then finally, before we launch, we fire it and hold it down and then release it only after we see all the parameters in the green. So really, the, the engines all fire a, a, a minimum of four times assuming everything goes perfectly and you don't have to redo anything, a minimum of four times before we ever let it go and let it fly. Um, let's see. And we got the launch pad at the Cape, which is Slick 40. We have the launch pad at Vandenberg. Not yet on the slide is our new launch pad, 39A. And, of course, we're looking for, I think you guys seen in the news, we're looking for a commercial launch pad, and one of our prime cat uh, candidates is right here in Texas, down in Brownsville. This is what we have going at, uh, in Texas, um, that, that thousand acres I talked about. The, this tripod in the bottom right is where we do this, the stage testing. Then we have individual engine stands over there in the bottom left. And then in the middle is uh, a lot of our hypergol facilities where we test our, our reaction control system. And in the, in the upper middle is where we have, you see where we have kind of a Y. There's a, a pad there where we launched a grasshopper. You guys seen the grasshopper? That was our test bed for basic terminal, terminal and uh, final landing and dis, dis, final descent and landing uh, phase of, of the RTLS of the first stage. And then uh, the Super Draco stand is where we test our launch abort system, which we uh, designed and, and, and developed and tested as part of CCDEV2 and now CCI cap. Uh, our launch facilities at the Cape, again, it's outdated because one of those shuttle pads is now ours, the bottom one. Um, and, uh, and then we have Slick 40 at Cape Canaveral Air Force Station. Both pads uh, will, will do uh, launch control from right outside the gate of Cape Canaveral Air Force Station there. That's where our, our launch control center is located. Uh, this, I think you guys know this already. I won't, I won't dwell on this. I, I, a lot of times I try to explain to people what commercial space is because it, it's, it's thrown around in the news as, as uh, this massive departure and this crazy new paradigm. Uh, but really, it's, you know, it's not that different. Uh, it, you know, as, as all of you know, contractors have always built all of NASA's spacecraft and, and launch vehicles. So this is nothing new. What's di different is just uh, the, the difference in relationship between uh, the government and the private sector. So 
one and 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 one and and really what it is it's a it's a different and that that different relationship is codified in a different contracting mechanism. That's really boring, right? Nobody's going to attend uh, a space up to talk about contracting mechanisms. But but let me beg your patience for just a little bit and say that traditional you have these uh, like shuttle was developed on a cost plus procurement uh, far based and and uh, where where really the government bears all the risk for cost overruns up to a certain point at which point Congress kills the program and then the contractor feels a little pain. Um, but short of that, the government bears all the risk. What's happening here in this new paradigm is, is it's fixed price, just like a commercial thing. Uh, you know, it's, you, 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 get, you get paid, if you, and it's milestone-based and performance-based, so you're incentivized to perform and to complete the work, and if you complete the work, you get paid. If you don't complete the work, you don't get paid. Uh, that's how, so, so really, a contractor bears a lot larger share of the, of the risk uh, for cost and schedule. And as far as roles and responsibilities, in the past, NASA controlled all aspects of the program, including design, development, testing, and, and had approval authority over everything. Uh, here, a lot of development is being done with NASA insight and, uh, and ultimately oversight. But in the, uh, in the early phases, where we are right now in ICAP, it's really the private contractor that makes all the design decisions and, um, and conducts all the, uh, all the test activities. Now, that's about to change because in, in this new, uh, the next phase, CCTCAP, um, the, when we get towards this end game where we get into verification and certification, NASA's firmly in the driver's seat. And NASA has a thousand, over a thousand requirements. We have to prove we meet each one to their satisfaction. NASA doesn't have to sign on the dotted line if they don't think we meet the requirement. Uh, and if we haven't done sufficient testing, uh, we, we have to keep going until they're happy. And so... Um, it's really, at the, in, in the end game of this whole thing, there's not a whole lot of difference between a traditional way of doing this and, and what we're doing now. And that's the, the, that's the portion we're heading into in the next round. Uh, you guys, I'll, I'll skip over this because this is, is uh, you guys all know this. We, we um, our, our, one of our, our, our big early successes was our first Dragon that approached the space station back in May of 2012. We became the first private company to get a spacecraft up to ISS and bring it back. Um, and uh, that was huge. That uh, I, I remember that uh, that was a very exciting day. Actually, I was I was staying there outside Mission Control, watching it. I didn't really have a role to play. I was just a spectator. But it was great being part. There's so much excitement, so much uh, 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 energy in, in in that room with all those people, and and so much knowledge. So I remember like everybody was screaming and hollering when it lifted off. But as we came close to staging, it all got really quiet. And we started listening, and then you saw the. Uh, when, when you could see the, uh, the, the second stage engine light, then boom, another roar came out. Everybody knew exactly what, what that meant. And when you saw the solar rays deploy, there was a hush again. And it was really cool. That was fun. And then we did it again. At we uh, CRS-1 back in October of 2012, went up and back to the space station. And we did it again in March of 2013. And that time we had the first external payment. So Dragon has a trunk where we can take, I'm sorry, external payload where we can take um, items up, big items up to the ISS. And, um, and, and that was the first time we had done that. So the next one will be uh, in March, and then we have one, the, su uh, the next one after that will be the summer. And I think that's the one where we fly mice. We're going to fly some mice on, on one of these. So if you guys see Mark Kelly's book, My Mousetronaut, uh, if you, well, we're, we're going we're gonna to fly the mice, and I think he's going to be out there selling his book. So if you, want, if you guys want an autographed copy. <laughs> so three successful cargo missions, uh, capability of coming back, but... Very proud of what we're doing with cargo, but really the, the, the whole point of SpaceX was to make, uh, to advance the cause of human spaceflight. So it's great that we're taking cargo to space, but that's not why Elon uh, made the company. He made the company to take people to space. And so we're very happy about what we're doing here uh, with, with, in partnership with NASA for, um, for human spaceflight. And w w what we started doing uh, a couple of years ago during CCDEV2 was, hey, basic layout of the cabin. Let's develop, we, de we designed, developed, and tested a, a launch aboard engine, which you see firing there. We call it the Super Draco. Our reaction control system thrusters are called Dracos. So that's a, it's a big Draco, so it's a Super Draco. Um, yeah. And then I uh, started looking at, well, what would it look like? Back then, we were thinking we were going to launch from our launch pad uh, LC-40 at Cape Canaveral. But since then, we've had to do a Delta PDR, actually, to, uh, to change everything over to 39A. And then uh, we started working on our ECLA system. Uh, during this next phase that we're in right now, CCI Cap and CPC, we're completing the design. 
We're doing a lot of hardware testing and uh, work and, and focusing on crew safety and preparing for cert. That's that's been that's kind of the theme of what we're up to right now. And uh, this is the obligatory chart that Chris referred to, saying everything we've done so far. Uh, we've those are all the milestones we've completed, which is the the vast majority of them. Uh, including the, the most recent one was a parachute drop test. You see a picture there of the helicopter lifting the Dragon out over Morro Bay. And uh, that was to, to prepare for the pad abort. We have a new parachute design different from the uh, cargo Dragon that has to be able to open at a lower altitude uh, and has significant uh, differences. And so um, we wanted to test that out before we tried the pad abort. And we had a very successful drop test uh, back on just five days before Christmas. So... You can see by number, we've, we're, we're, we're almost done, <laughs> but we got some big stuff left. The last four milestones are doozies. So we got, um, first of all, the critical design review, which is coming up in just a couple months, and then uh, some really big test activities. Uh, the, the primary structure qualification, we're going to take the weldment of both the, the capsule and the trunk and put it through a severe load test and look at stress and strain and make sure we have a good uh, solid design in that the uh, actuals match predictions of, uh, of our finite element models. So that's coming up, um, and uh, we're, we're, we're fabricating that, that primary structure right now. And then we're going to do this, uh, the pad abort test and the in-flight abort test. Um, so we're going to take uh, a Dragon uh, from zero altitude, zero air, airspeed, get it safely out over the ocean, and get the parachutes open and, and uh, make sure that all works. And then we're going to do the in-flight abort test right around max Q, uh, take it up uh, to that critical stress case and make sure we can still separate from Falcon 9. So basically the pad abort test proves that you have enough gas in the tank and the in-flight abort test proves you have enough horsepower in the engines. And if you got both of those corner cases, um, uh, we think that through analysis we can prove it's going to work everywhere else in the trajectory. Whew. Okay, I think that's, yeah, that's the last slide. So, um, uh, you know, I know we're going to take questions later, right? So I'll just leave it right there and uh, answer any questions you have when we come back up. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, and uh, the last panelist for tonight is Jeff Siders. Um, we, Cindy and I were talking earlier, Jeff, um, since uh, both Chris and Garrett are retired astronauts, I think tonight we'll make you an honorary astronaut, right? <laughs> so. Well, thank you. That's great. Uh, <laughs> um, I guess three words. I, I would go along with Chris on a Friday and beer. But uh, for my background, I'd say golfing, fishing, and space shuttle. Nice. Uh, so I spent my first 25 years of my career working space shuttle program and then started working here with Orbital uh, doing commercial cargo. So let me go to the next slide. Actually, it's good to be back. I was here about oops, a year ago, and at the time, I had a lot of you know, view graphs and drawings about what we were going to do. So now I've got a lot of pictures of what we have done in the last year. So first, a few slides on uh, what Orbital is all about. Uh, Orbital's been around since 82. Uh, it's a lead aerospace company doing a lot of satellite development, uh, launch vehicle work. You can see the numbers shown there. Uh, we're up to about 3,600 employees. And I'll show you the facilities we've got. Our headquarters is out in Dulles, Virginia, where we do all the satellite manufacturing on the East Coast. And then in Chandler, we have a launch vehicle development facility. And we also do, in Gilbert, uh, a lot of satellite development out there as well. And then a small, smaller office up in Greenbelt doing technical services. And that group manages the range at uh, Wallops as well. A little bit about Orbital. Uh, you can see all the customers we have in our customer base. And we're Diversified there between DOD work, NASA work, and commercial work, so it's a pretty even split. And then a little more numbers on uh, some of the payloads and satellites we've been developing over the past 30 years. So, now to really talk about what we do in commercial cargo. We're in one of the two providers along with SpaceX, flying cargo to the space station. And over the last few months, we've completed a demo mission, which is the patch there on the, on the left. And we've just completed our first CRS mission a few days ago when we splash down in the ocean. So um, what we are all about, and you can see I've got a real photo now of our hardware in space, which is nice. So we started um, back in 2009, I believe, when we got the contract. Uh, we've done our first test flight in April and the demonstration flight then in September. And then we launched our CRS mission, delivered cargo to station uh, back in January. 
and also then also brought back some trash and I'll show you some pictures on that. So this is our vehicle. Um, I think I've mentioned in the past, we're essentially two elements in our vehicle. We've got the, the top half there, which is the pressurized cargo module built by Elenia, which does a lot of the hardware that was on the station. So that's our pressurized capability. You can see there, 2,000 kilograms is what we currently fly. In, uh, let's see, Orb 4, which is later this year, actually January, uh, we'll be stepping up, adding another barrel section to that PCM so we can go up to about 2,700 kilograms. Uh, let's see, we're berthing, so you'll see that we have a, an arm from the station that will grab us and, and bring us to the berthing port. The bottom half of the spacecraft, the service module, that's where all the smarts are, smarts are with the prop systems, the power, the nav, um, and it's all based on some of the orbital heritage hardware we do in ge uh, geosatellites and, and things like that. On our launch vehicle, this is the Antares rocket. Uh, it's LOX, uh, kerosene, and then we've got a solid upper stage built by ATK. And you can see we've actually got a launch picture now, so that's good to see. Uh, this is for those that like all the technical details, this is our launch profile getting into the station orbit. I won't dwell on a lot of, a lot of those numbers. And this is our ground track. Uh, we fly down, we just cross the tip there of Brazil. Um, so no real overflight problems with the FAA. And then we had to do our own mission control. Uh, up in Dulles, we have four or five control centers that we do typical satellite operations. So now we have a dedicated control center for Cygnus. And you can see on our last mission, everyone wore these hockey shirts with the orbital colors, which is real popular. Um, and then we have a tie into here, into the JSC Mission Control Center. Uh, let's see what else. And then, as I mentioned, after we deliver the cargo, the crew reloads the Cygnus with all the disposal cargo they have on board, and then we safely destruct that over the Pacific Ocean. So a little bit about just taking it through the whole flow of getting ready for a flight. Uh, we start everything, everything comes together in Wallops, Virginia. That's our launch site. Uh, we build the service module there in the left in Dulles and then truck it over to, uh, to Wallops. The top picture, well actually, let me go to the bottom uh, right picture there is the PCMs built by Lania, and that's in Italy, their facility there. They ship them to Wallops on this Ananoff aircraft, which is huge, uh, and then gets trucked into the uh, facilities. We come in and load the cargo that NASA delivers to us. Uh, you can see once it's all loaded, we close the hatch, do all the pressure checks, then bring it over to the facility. This is the horizontal integration facility in Wallops. You can see we can actually manage three core rockets there, there it's, but hopefully we don't have to ever get to that point. But uh, typically there's two vehicles going on simultaneously. So you can see the Orb-1 rocket there on the left, uh, the fairing there in the middle, and this is our transporter erector uh, structure on the far right. I'll show you a little bit more of those. So as we get going, once the rocket's ready and the engines are all assembled, it's lifted over and put into that tail structure. And then the Cygnus is mounted to the top of the rocket there. Then the fairing comes over. Then the fairing is built down in Gilbert, and it's brought it back up to, uh, to Wallops. Uh, it's all put together there at, at uh, H100, or no, sorry, the HIF. And once it's all ready to go, we roll it out to the pad. So this is all new launch infrastructure. It was built by the Mid-Atlantic Regional Spaceport, Orbital, and NASA. We all contributed to the development of this new launch infrastructure. Once it's at the pad, we use the tail to raise the rocket to the vertical. And once it's ready to go, we launch. This is a nice daylight launch. Uh, we're looking forward to another night launch. So here's some pictures on orbit. Uh, approaching station. You can see our logos there on the side of the spacecraft. This is the, the short module, as I mentioned. And then the picture on the right there is over the, the Middle East, which is always a nice nice shot. Of course, the crew brings us on board. They uh, get in the cupola, uh, man in the arm, and bring us uh, to the, the right berthing port on node two. And you can see there we're, we're all grappled. And then once we're grappled, the crew opens the hatch, starts to unload the cargo. You can see we've got the, the duct tube there that provides the, uh, the air circulation throughout the module when the crew's in, uh, in the module unloading cargo. Four mid-deck lockers along the front there. This is kind of a minimum load we did on the, the first mission, demo mission. Of course, we have the crew helping out. We've got to be sure they're all accounted for when we leave. <laughs> and in our flight, uh, we just did, we, we brought up ants. 
So we have ants in space. Uh, actually, what's interesting here is when they're getting ready for flight, they we had a what was it oh the station had a problem. We had to wait for another month until the the station um, what was that problem we had with the pump the cooling. cooling yeah yeah. So while we were waiting, they had to recycle the ants, and they ran out of the control set of ants. So they ran over to our uh, was it V55 propellant facility and grabbed some ants on the ground there. And that became, that became the control set of ants for the, the mission. So. Uh, let's see, we also brought up some powered payloads with uh, vaccine experiments. And then this, folks are probably familiar with the spear experiments going on station. And of course, we bring in the fresh food the crew likes. And oh, this is, uh, we, we name uh, and dedicate each of our Cygnus modules to um, Space Hero. Um, this last mission was Gordon Fullerton. Uh, Gordon actually participated with Orbital in our Pegasus program and did, did some of the drops of our Orbital missions, uh, the Pegasus missions. And you can see here, when we get ready to leave, the crew kind of stuffs everything they can into the Cygnus for disposal. There's not much room left there. And then we're, we close the hatch, separate away, and then we target a reentry over the Pacific Ocean. And we're done. So, looking ahead, uh, we just completed our first mission, like I said earlier this week. Our next one is May 1st. And then after that, we've got two more coming up fairly regularly paced. Uh, another one in October, and then Orb 4 in January. And we've got flights all the way planned out through late uh, 2016. And beyond station, we're starting to look at ways of using the components of Cygnus, the service module, maybe as a um, tr orbital transfer vehicle, or doing some other testing uh, of automated rendezvous and docking systems or uh, um, exploration technologies, things like that. Uh, in fact, we're also starting to engage with JSC on exploration use of a Cygnus as a logistics module at asteroid missions or, or a habitation type module. This is kind of one of the, the drawings kind of showing an outpost where you've got a, a Cygnus there bringing up cargo with an Orion and some sort of docking node and something that could be out there someday. And that's it. Awesome. All right, thank you. So, uh, so this is uh, actually the most fun part of the commercial space flight panels, where we get to interact and have, uh, have questions. And um, if nobody asks a question, I have really hard ones. So, I have one about a robot in space. A robot in space. <laughs> She's teasing me. I, I got to meet the uh, the R five today, and so that was kind of fun. Yes, go ahead. Do you have a planning date for the pad abort test on it? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Should be on. Give it a tap. Testing. Yeah, okay. There we go. Uh, yes, we have. Uh, actually, we're we're not doing our pad abort test at the Cape. Uh, we're doing it out at White Sands. And uh, matter of fact, we have a test readiness review, um, or not test readiness. I think it's a test. We we have a test event next week that is uh, out at White Sands that are part of that. It, it's, Far, I, I probably can't tell you or shouldn't tell you when exactly it is, but I, we do have a date out there for pad abort. Yeah. Okay, is it uh, sometime just later than this year or next year? Uh, boy, I'll tell you, I may have to, I may have to phone a friend. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's scheduled for the, well, I don't think it's scheduled for this year. Oh, okay. But I'm, I'm, I'm not, you can tell a real reliable source, okay. can't you? <laughs> Well, that's yeah. where we did all the tests for Apollo was uh, White Sands. 
Uh, how about SpaceX? You had it listed, but there was no uh, time for the Cape pad board test. Yes, uh, it's 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 um it is this year. <laughs> oh, okay. And uh, it's it's scheduled for um it's going to be early this summer, basically. Awesome. Okay. Awesome. We have another question. So we got one right over here. I guess we have one mic, and I would think that one through then. Hi. So this is a question for a gentleman from Boeing and SpaceX. And I understand you guys are in a competition to take a flag off of the space station. Um, a little bit of experience. I've flown in a Boeing spacecraft before, and I've dealt with PayPal. And I must <laughs> admit that one is more pleasurable than the other. And so, uh, my question. <laughs> <laughs> so, the basic distinction is Boeing is a big company. It's a very large, established complex, and SpaceX is fairly new. It's highly mobile. It's a very competitive company. And if you would please tell me if you can see an advantage to either one or the other uh, approach to space, because space is expensive, it's hard, and putting a man in space is not very easy. So <laughs> can, you, can, you, can you provide some insight into one over the other, if you, if you believe you can take the flag first? First, I'm just wondering, was your PayPal experience like was that a bad experience or was that the good one? Which was the, which was the good one? I, I'm not sure which. I've never flown in, in anything except economy class, so <laughs> tell me. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I think there are, it's interesting. It's going to be very interesting for NASA. They have a clear distinction. I mean, you have um, a company that's been around for a long time. It's got a lot of heritage in, in uh in human space flight, and then you've got a company that's been up, um, that is was more recent, but been very innovative, make a lot of recent progress, and has uh, I think a, a a lot to offer. So, you know, th there's there's um, a clear distinction, but I think um, you know, it, it, in the end, it's not all, it's it's really not all that different when you look at. We still have to go through all the same wickets, whether whichever company is selected, it's still got to go through the same NASA certification process have the same products, you know, we, we, we both have to deliver hazard reports, verification and validation plans, certification plans, and, and then go through and get all the VCN signs. So I think, you know, uh, in reality, it's not, gonna, it's not gonna matter that much in the next phase. I think it's gonna be a very similar type of thing, no matter which, or hopefully both of us uh, are participating. So Chris? Um, so, uh, you know, there's a saying in aviation is you're only as good as your last landing, right? And, and just because, uh, you know, Boeing's been in this business for 50 years, uh, it doesn't grant them um, immunity from uh, having a bad day. So, you know, the one thing I, I tell to folks is this is a hard business. This really, I mean, Andre, you know it because you work it day in and day out. It's very challenging to put together uh, a system that will uh, that will take humans to space, and and we find I'm Garrett. I'm I'm sure SpaceX is wrestling with the same thing, and you know even Jeff. I mean it, it's this is this is not an easy business, um, but uh, but I'm I'm glad we're a part of it. I think that in the long run it's going to work out very well for the country uh, to get them a low you know a cost effective but safe way uh, to get back and forth to low Earth orbit, and again you know this is really hopefully is just a stepping off point. Um, you know we have uh, we have space station for ten more years now, right? Ten more years sounds like a long time. Well, guess what? You know, station has already exceeded that already. I mean, station's been with us for about 14 years so far. So uh, 10 years is going to be around the corner. And th there's one thing that we need to do right now while we have station is sort of gain that permanent toehold in lower Earth orbit. You have to maintain the business case for these commercial providers so that they have a reason to continue to go back. Uh, if, we, if we lose station and we have no follow-on, whether it's a commercial or government program, uh, we're going to have, um, we have done us a great disservice to ourselves. We need to provide the platform, the destination in space that, that, that a commercial provider can provide transportation to. Because just going up in space and hanging around for two days in one of our tight little modules will get you cranky pretty quick. You've got to have some place to go. So uh, anyhow, that's my two so cents on this is a difficult business. Can I, if I can expand that question a little bit, because um, you know, one of the things that I think is, uh, is the hopefulness of the commercial spaceflight industry is the fact that 
commerce may be able to do it more economically or more efficiently in some way better than the government to meet a much broader set of needs. Like Garrett, you said um, you really want to fly uh, tourists in space, right? Or you want to fly paying customers that aren't U.S. citizens or U.S. astronauts into space. And so um, I'm curious, um, since uh, cargo came first, which really kind of makes sense, I was going to ask Jeff how Orbital um, adapted to this different sort of commercial model compared to the standard um, U.S. government contracting technique. You know, has it has it been a good experience? Uh, oh yeah, definitely. It's been a definitely been a good experience. Um, of course, Orbital has some heritage and processes in how to building spacecraft, uh, but it's a whole new thing to build human-rated spacecraft that's safe to hit and or not hit. Did not hit station, <laughs> uh, so there's a lot of lot of work to go get involved, and having NASA along as a real partner to show us the way, uh, provide the lessons learned they've had over the many years of space flight, you know, it was a work hand in hand partnership to get it to where we were successful. Yeah, it, it's interesting that that you can offer services. Um, and you know, SpaceX has an open pricing um, website, and uh, you can offer uh, launch services at the rates that you that you show, and you begin to recognize that the U.S. government can't do the same thing. And so, at some point, you begin to want to figure out, well, what is it that the government is doing that uh, commercial enterprise seems to be able to um, not get bogged down with in terms of the expense, and um, so at some point, I don't because I really liked your question and I kind of expanded on it. I'm interested in knowing, you know, from you know, Boeing and SpaceX, what have you found that's been like the big thing that's been able to um, make this business case close? Hmm. Well, you, you know, it's, <laughs> it's top it's kind secret, of, right? Yeah, I, you're asking <laughs> for the the secret sauce. Um, but I, I guess that it's a, it's it's it, I don't have a simple one simple answer. For, I would point to a lot of different things that that has allowed SpaceX to to do things for um, a greatly reduced cost and and uh, and still achieve the same reliability and and, and safety. So I, I would say um, uh, one thing is you know and it's very interesting because because Orbital and SpaceX went about the cargo side of this in a very different fashion. Um, uh, one of the things I, I think that works very well for us at SpaceX is we're v highly vertically integrated. Mm -hmm. So over 80% of both the rocket, I'm sorry, between 70 and 80% of both the rocket and the spacecraft are built from raw material under our roof. Uh, so we don't really have any major subcontractors. Uh, and, and, and what we find is that helps us out a lot because um, we're all... You have you have excellent communication because you're all you all work together with with one badge under one roof, so not only is it one company, we're also all co-located. We're all co-located. We're all in Hawthorne. Um, we don't have uh, uh, you know uh, the rocket being built in one part of the country and the spacecraft being built in another or anything like that. You, if you want to if you want to see uh, what the hardware looks like, you just get up up uh, out of your desk, walk about a hundred feet out to the factory floor, and see it come off the assembly line. So. So that helps us out a lot in, in some obvious ways about our ability to c control cost and schedule, but also in some less obvious ways. And one of those is, is our ability uh, to make changes mm -hmm. without, so, so traditionally what you have to do in a, in, a, in, a, in a traditional systems engineering approach is take all the requirements, flow them all the way down and, and write subsystem specs in, in, in the very beginning and then go write all your subcontracts and do all your contracting with, with all your subs and suppliers and then everything's locked in from day one, and it's very difficult to change things. Well, when, when, when we, if we want to make a change, even a drastic change, uh, to, the, to the vehicle, because we found a better way, uh, we can just do it. We don't have to renegotiate a contract. We don't have to fire one contractor, pay their termination fees, and, and get another contractor. So, so that's, that's one thing that's, that's, um, that's, that's really worked very well for us. And the other is kind of a, a, a back to the future approach, which is, um, we operate in a lot of ways a lot like uh, the Skunk Works operated and a lot like NASA operated during the early days, like during Apollo, which is that we do a lot of rapid design build test cycles. So we won't spend years doing analysis uh, before we do a test. A lot of times test has become in our business too often um, 
a verification, a, a, a verification, or I'm sorry, a validation exercise, rather than a learning experience. Uh, where you've done analysis for years because you're so afraid, the test is so expensive and you're, you're so afraid of bad publicity for the program if it fails that you spend years doing analysis before you finally do the test. We'll just do it. And, and sometimes it doesn't work. Like uh, on our first flight of, uh, uh, of the Falcon 9 1.1, we, a, a we relit the second stage. We didn't have to. We dropped off all of our payloads in low Earth orbit. We didn't have to relight the second stage, but we did. Just, to dem just, to, just instead of spending a year doing analysis, to, to make sure it's going to work, we figured, well, we'll we, we can do it on this mission. Let's just try it and see what happens. Uh, it turns out it didn't work. Uh, the the T-tab lines the, froze because the the in in zero in in, uh, in a vacuum of space, the expansion of the venting of the locks was such that it deposited on the lines and froze. But you know what? We found it out like that. And if we did a year's worth of analysis, we might have figured it out. But we also might not have, and it still might have happened, right? But we found out the very next mission. We, uh, in, in the one month interval between the two missions, we uh, changed events, we added insulation, we tested it on the ground, we flew it, worked, worked fine. So that's the kind of um, thing that was very common back in the days of the Skunk Works and back in the early days of Apollo, but I think our industry has gotten away from somewhat. And I, I would point to those two, two mm -hmm. things. Sorry, I, I rambled on for a long time. Th that's I, thought right. I, was, I thought I was going to kind of defer on that answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, why don't we ask uh, Chris if uh, Boeing has an angle on, on what's different between commercial and traditional contracting that makes you think that the business case is going to close on this? Um, so, you know, therein really lies the secret. I mean, how do, you, how, do we, how do we go out and do this as an organization so that we put mission success and crew safety at the top and then build the infrastructure that's underneath it that that does it in a cost-effective way so that you can not only do it but then you have to you know you, the government is retaining competition for this specific reason it is basically to you know drive us into you know how can we do this as cost-effectively as possible and there's a lot of ways you know there's a lot of ways to do it and, and it really is the secret sauce but I'll you know I'll just give you a little insight into sort of our line of thinking. Um, you know, shuttle was a very complex vehicle and it had multi layers of processes and teams and organizations. We've really tried to strip away a lot that is that is unnecessary. You know, you look at uh, training, you look at simulation, you know, do I need to build a, a large simulator that's motion related and has all these interacted entities and you know, maybe we don't need to do that. Uh, do I need to have a large footprint at the launch facility? Well, maybe I don't need to do that. So you just you, you start start with the shuttle or the business as usual as a model, and you pair away those things that we may have added on throughout the years in the name of blank, uh, but we're sort of wiping the slate clean and saying, rather than you know starting that and moving, let's start from the bottom and say, what do we absolutely positively need? So zero so, basing, essentially. Um, yes, which it's in, uh, in a positive it, light. It, yeah, it's yeah. Uh, you know, uh, forget the paradigm. Let's uh, start over from scratch and figure out what we need to do to make this effective uh, from a cost and a mission success perspective. Awesome, thank you. Um, we can take more questions. We got one right here, BK. We need orbital questions. We need orbital questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to disappoint and ask a, a crew question. Um, sorry. <laughs> uh, I think NASA has said that the uh, down select will be coming later this year by August, I think. And I um, was curious where both companies stand with regards to if you don't make it through the down select, the forward plan for CST-100 and Dragon as a crewed vehicle. Uh, I'll start. Hey, Robert, how you doing? Um, I, <laughs> I, do, uh, I do think that, uh, well, I know we've done a lot of thinking about it. I, it's probably not appropriate to speculate because I really don't know what the company intends to do. But let me start by saying that NASA has been very um, uh, overt in its interest in carrying more than one. Um, so uh, I, I don't know where that will all lead. I don't know if the country can afford more than one. Pr probably it's not my, you know, it's not my place to say. Um, but uh, if there is only one, um, you know, there, there's more than just perhaps the NASA customer out there. You know, there's, uh, there's, there's other deals to be made, and, and I'll just leave it at that. So uh, I don't think you're going to see, uh, first of all, Boeing doesn't plan on being out of the game, but I don't think that you're going to see them completely out of the game. Let's just leave it at that. Hi, Robert. <laughs> <laughs> 
So, um, yeah, so echo what, what Chris said. I, I think this, this new model works best uh, when there's competition. All, all uh, commercial activities work, work best for the consumer, for the customer, when there's competition. And I think it's, my personal opinion is it's really in NASA's best interest to, to keep competition to the next phase. It's worked well for cargo. It's kept us both honest. <laughs> and, um, uh, and I think it's, I think NASA's uh, doing the country, uh, or I think Congress would be doing the country a disservice if they terminated uh, competition too early. But having said that, um, if there's only one and it's, and, and, and the other reason I really want there to be competition is I want to do more of these panels with Chris. Because, uh, <laughs> you know, it's, it's a lot of fun. Um, <laughs> Uh, so, um, if, uh, if there is only one and it's not us, uh, then in that case, uh, we would still definitely press ahead because it's the, it's the whole reason for the company's being. Now, without NASA's uh, partnership, it will uh, undoubtedly happen at a slower pace and um, in a, in a, in a, probably in a different direction, but it will continue. Thanks. Have we got a question maybe over on this side? So I can make BK, PK run with the mic. Here we, here we go in the middle. And then we'll come back to him. Is it live? We'll get yeah. you in the back end uh, next. Right. So this question is for um, our former NASA astronauts. Let's assume that NASA does go forward with both and, vehicles. And honorary astronauts. And honorary. Yeah. All right, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm curious about, um, have you folks thought at all about the commonality of training if you have dissimilar cockpits, dissimilar avionics, where you're, you're training your crew and you've got two different vehicles? Yeah, it's, it's a very valid, very valid point. And, and that question is probably better asked of NASA. Uh, I mean, I've, I've talked to them a few times and said, you know, if you, if you project out there when uh, NASA intends to fly their first commercial crew, I think the sort of the word right now is late 2017. Um, at least that's, I, I think, where they have Soyuz flights out to. So that's where I'm anticipating they're expecting the commercial partners to pick up. If you back that up two and a half years, you know, you're at the middle of 2015, if I did my math correctly. And, uh, you know, that's really a year away. So the first crew that's going to fly in one of these spacecraft uh, has to start training in some way, shape, or form to do just that about a year from now. So we're hoping that, you know, that the guidance begins to come down on where that's, where, how, how NASA's going to manage that. I would think if we do retain two, uh, you'll, you'll see, I don't want to call it a split in the office, but uh, I know that our training flow is designed such that you can come in to that two and a half year station flow, take a segment of that out, and that will be your CST 100 training, and, and you don't have to have any prior instruction before that. You will, you will get everything you need in the course of that two and a half year station flow. And, and I'm not sure if Garrett's plan is the same way, but uh, uh, you know, I, I, I see that materializing. So you just assign, when you assign the crew to their station flow, you assign them to a, a vehicle. Now they have to stay with that vehicle. They can't switch back and forth, but, uh, but I, I see how NASA can make that, make that work just fine. Yeah, our, our plan is pretty similar. Um, and I, I'm not, you know, th there was some talk early on about commonality of cockpit di displays, kind of like what Airbus does with all the different models of the airliners. Um, but, hey, you know, I would love if it were the case that we would have to deal with the, the, uh, with the scenario where you have an astronaut that flies in a CST-100 and then the next day climbs into a Dragon and flies that and the next day flies, uh, you know, uh, uh, dream chaser or whatever you know it, but the fact of the matter is this is not going to be like an airline for a long time you're not going to be jumping from a 737 a Boeing vehicle to an Airbus vehicle to something uh, to something else on a on a relatively rapid pace so so I think there's no real operational issue with learning one cockpit and then learning a different cockpit for the vehicle you're going to fly three years later um, mm -hmm. you know we do it right now with Soyuz we had we had guys in the office that were flying Soyuz and at the same time preparing to fly shuttle. When I was training for station, I didn't know if I was going up on Soyuz or shuttle till near the very end, I was training on both. So it's, it's eminently doable. So um, if I could just sort of follow up on that for some of the people that, um, myself included, that haven't really been following this as closely as maybe they should have. Uh, um, you know, the traditional idea that a flight mission has a pilot and a commander um, how does that work in the commercial environment? I mean, uh, uh, is uh, Boeing, is SpaceX actually going to supply the pilot that will carry the NASA 
human cargo, if you will, to, to ISS? I, you know, I think we're the same, <coughs> but I'll let you disagree with me if, if not. But early on, there's this talk about like a taxi versus a rental car model, right. where if, the, if it was a taxi model, the, the co SpaceX or Boeing would provide the flight crew and, and the, the NASA astronauts going up and down the station would be passengers, basically. Um, or the rental car where we build it, operate it, but we say, here, here are the keys, uh, you, you guys go fly it. We both ended up on the rental car ah. model where um, our intent is for all the, all the uh, on a NASA mission, for all the seats to be taken up by NASA astronauts, and we're going to train the NASA astronauts to fly the Dragon. And then we have to bring it back with a full tank. <laughs> And, and definitely get the damage collision waiver. Yeah. Highly, <laughs> so, highly recommend it. So, Chris, would you agree with that? Um, yeah, and yeah. we'll um, we'll do whatever the cust whatever the you know whatever our, our uh, whatever NASA wants. I mean, we can we can take somebody up there and come home. But I think that the way that they sort of hopscotch vehicles on the space station, you sort of need to have your rescue craft stay there. So I think that the taxi um, or the rental car model, where you know Na we just give the vehicle to, to NASA and they you know, they put their four astronauts in it and take it up. That that lends itself very well to keeping your lifeboat attached to the space station while while you're there. Yeah. Now, I really haven't thought a whole lot if they end up picking two partners. Um, just the way that the the RFP, the the contractual part of this went, is you, you get it's like in two flight slices, so you, you'll get two flights. I, um, so I guess they'll be back to back to a certain degree, but there will be some degree of uncommonality, if you will, in vehicle handover uh, if they end up with going with two providers. So that, that'll be a little bit interesting. It's something we'll have to work out when we get there. Great. And I promise this gentleman in the back has been real patient that we pick up his question. I'm going to ask a question to Jeff in just a second if nobody else does. I, yeah, I, I actually have one for Jeff. <laughs> I'm getting there. So where do I look? Here? There? That way? Um, okay, so... <laughs> I actually, look at him. <laughs> Just say hi, mom, and then ask. Hi, mom. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. So, let's just say you had an unlimited supply of cash in your all three of your bank accounts. Um, oh, now we're talking PayPal, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, what would be the single most problem um, for sending a commercial crew on a Mars flyby, for example? What would be the, the biggest issue? That's for all three of you, I guess. I'll, I'll start. Um, vehicles are designed for specific purposes. Uh, you know, right now with, with our concept and our booster and our power system, it, we really couldn't wander much beyond low Earth orbit. So that bucket of cash you're talking about, it would probably have to be so big that you just start over again. I mean, that, that, that's my take on it. Uh, and, uh, you know, look at what, what NASA's building in the SLS Space Launch System. I mean, this is a 380-foot behemoth. You know, that's the thing that's designed to go out to Mars. Um, ours are sort of the sports car versions that are just, you know, they go 200 miles back and forth. And uh, uh, you would have to wipe this light clean and start over again if you wanted to take, you know, our design uh, much beyond uh, low Earth orbit. Yeah, so, so you guys probably know my boss wants to retire on Mars. And... <laughs> And not alone, he wants a couple hundred thousand people with him uh, to start a colony. And so he's definitely thinking about going there, but he's, you're not going to get a couple hundred thousand people to Mars seven at a time. <laughs> <laughs> so we're definitely going to do that with, another, with a much larger vehicle. And uh, it's not like we have a big secret facility somewhere where they're working on that, but we, we definitely got guys thinking about it. And um, uh, so if we had unlimited cash, we would probably have that secret facilities <laughs> 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 somewhere and we'd be a little further ahead. Uh, but, you know, we're going to learn a lot in low Earth orbit and um, that's going to, uh, and, and, and we're going to get a lot of capabilities, a lot of infrastructure. But uh, other than as a potential carry along with the big ship and use as a reentry vehicle when we come home, I, I don't see the current version of Dragon going, um, going all the way to Mars. But uh, the other big challenge I'll throw out there as a, a shorter answer to your question is, uh, even with all that money, uh, you still have to deal with radiation. And that's probably uh, the radiation environment once you leave low Earth orbit, uh, both the physiological effects on the crew and also the effects on the, on the hardware, especially the avionics, uh, it, that's a, a bit of a game changer that you've got to deal with. So uh, I'll just chime in speaking as a former Deputy Director of Planetary Science Mar uh, with robotics mission, robotic missions even. Mars is extremely hard. And um, so the agency is struggling 
Um, but set that destination for the 2035s at least to put boots on Mars. Colonies, I don't know about that, but at some point we're going to give that a shot. And, um, and we certainly don't have unlimited cash either, so we're trying to figure out how to get it in the box. So, Jeff? I, yeah, I got a little bit from the Cygnus perspective. Uh, we had recently done some study work with uh, Dennis Tito who's not unlimited funds, but he had some funds. Uh, and he had some thoughts about doing a free return trajectory around Mars with a couple of folks. Uh, so we had worked with him for a little bit on what a Cygnus might have to be to accommodate, you know, a minimum crew size for a five, 600 day mission. And as Garrett said, the radiation environments, uh, the amount of volume you need to keep two crew happy and, and for exercise and all the, the ECLIS required. And there, there's so many challenges in getting there. It's, it's gonna be a while. Yeah, I, I want to change the energy or the topic anyway in, in the conversation now and, and, and talk about launch sites. And so I'm going to put Orbital on the spot and say, Virginia, really? Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, what, uh, what was it that led uh, you all to Virginia? And then maybe we'll just, if, uh, if SpaceX and Boeing have anything they want to say about the launch sites that they're looking at, or landing sites even, that would be? Well, let's see, Virginia. Um, of course, it was before my time when we made that selection, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> I can't go to all the rationale. Uh, but Virginia, it's, it's close to our facilities there in Dulles. Um, we also looked at it from a range perspective to get away from the KSC and the Patrick range concerns, so we'd have more of a less complex, less traffic model at the, at the Wallops range facility. Uh, it was also fresh territory, so we were able to build what we wanted to build. Uh, there was also a partnership with the Mid-Atlantic Regional Spaceport there, who was looking to make Virginia one of the spaceport kind of, kind of sites. I think that was it. And, and so I, they kind of made it attractive uh, to Orbital to settle in that neck of the woods. Right, yeah, it was all part of that, what makes best business sense. Right. Uh, and that's the occasion worked out. Before Garrett chimes in, I'll just say, um, when I was in planetary science, we put together this mission called LADEE. And, um, and we thought, well, this is great. We're going to launch it on a Minotaur 5 out of Wallops Island, so we won't have uh, range congestion like we normally do at Kennedy Space Center. And when it came right down to the final days to, to get LADEE a launch date, we were in a horse race with Antares. Yeah, with, with and, ourselves. That was and, one thing, and, yeah. And, and yeah. the two pads are like within 100 yards of each other. So it's 800 it, feet. Eight, there you go. Yeah, I know. We, that's feet. the one thing we hadn't thought so, about was traffic problems between our own launches. So, yeah. <laughs> well, we've solved that now. Both were successful, by the way. I'll, I'll defend Virginia a little bit. I mean, it's, it's uh, um, you know, as long as you're going up to 51.6 inclination, mm -hmm. it's not a bad place to launch out of. If you're, if you're trying to maximize performance, uh, and if you're going to anything less than 40 degrees inclination, then you definitely don't want to be there. But if you're going 40 or higher, it's, it's a good uh, spot to start. It's right. not bad, yeah. and you don't fly over to anybody's house, right? right. Except for a little bit of Brazil. But so we, we're, uh, as far as our launch sites go, we, we, uh, the way we see this working is, we have Slick 40 right now at Cape Canaveral Air Force Station. That's where we're launching all of our Falcon 9s uh, uh, that, that, um, that aren't polar orbiting. Uh, we have Vandy to do polar orbits. Um, and eventually what, we, we, what we'll see is Vandy will continue to be where we launch anything that, that orbits uh, north-south. Uh, Slick 40 will be where we continue to launch uh, Department of Defense uh, and other government customers out of, um, uh, un but uh, that are not crew missions. 39A will be crew missions, and we'll have, we're, there we're building it, uh, we're going to use the existing tower actually, but we're adding a new gantry arm and white room and a couple other, uh, some other infrastructure. And, um, and then, and also Falcon Heavy, because the, the uh, flame trench at, at 39A is perfect for, for Falcon Heavy. So we'll be launching Falcon Heavies out of there as well. We'll also launch Falcon Heavies out of Vandenberg that are going north-south. And then finally, uh, we want to move our commercial geostationary uh, GTO orbit, GTO transfer orbit launches uh, on Falcon 9 uh, to a new site. And if it's Brownsville, it works out pretty well to go into geo orbit because if you thread the needle between Miami and, and Cuba, it puts you on a good trajectory to uh, get to a GTO transfer orbit. So that's yeah. kind of the grand plan that we're hoping to implement in the next couple of years. Nice. Chris? 
Uh, well, I mean, when you launch on an Atlas V, you sort of have to go out of one of the Atlas V launch sites. Right. Um, but uh, you know, it's 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 a very it's it's an environment we're used to. You know, we're we're used to going to the station from uh, from from KSC. So I I really don't have anything. Y you mentioned landing sites, though. Yeah, because you know, I was intrigued by your lake bed. Yeah, the the landing oh, site uh, is uh, is an interesting thing, and uh, finding the right, like I said, the right your your cross range, the the ability that you have to deviate either side of your orbital track. You know, we got used to a very luxurious 800 miles about on the space shuttle. You know, we could basically land anywhere we wanted to, and and it's very interesting working with a capsule that can fly, but it flies you know, not as well as uh, anything with wings on it. Uh, getting that, that cross range that you need to get to these sites, and we're finding, you know, I, I, I thought we'd come down any day, any place, but it is, it's a challenge to find the right geographically located places to give you the landing opportunities that you need, because you have to have at least one a day, right? I mean, uh, and uh, to, to find those places in just the right place that has the right combination of weather, geographic terrain, I mean, it really is, it's a little bit of a lining up the Swiss cheese holes to find the right places. And yeah. uh, we, we think we have a few. Uh, of course, we can't get them to call us back. Uh, <laughs> I, w <laughs> I wish they would pick up their phone. We're, tr we're trying to give these government ranges business, and uh, it's been... Uh, there's a there's a long line of paperwork we got to get through to work with them, but you know we're we're confident we're going to get them on board and supporting us. So uh, unlike the um, the the stunt parachutists, you won't be dropping into like a Super Bowl game or anything like that. No. All right. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, have we got another question from the audience? Uh, okay, or one in the back there, and then we'll flip over to this side. A more technical question. Um, I know that you're not planning on doing a long-term, or it, the, the spacecrafts are not designed for long-term missions, but what would be the longest duration that your spacecrafts could stay up in orbit? And also, how are you dealing with human wastes? <laughs> uh, we plan to put all of our human waste in the Cygnus. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I can answer that question really uh, simply. We, we, we do tend to have facilities to deal with human waste uh, in, in Dragon. Uh, you know, it, we, won't, um, we want to accommodate a, a range of, of rendezvous profiles, including ones where you might want to use a, the bathroom. So, um, uh, so we will have the facilities for that, both liquid and solid, if, if you're curious. Um, and... Uh, was it the other question again was uh, how long? How long can we stay? Um, you know, it, it depends on the crew can complement and, um, uh, and and how we load the consumables. But we're talking about missions that are you know total. With y we have to ca account for a bunch of stack contingencies, so that pushes you out to something less than a week uh, in in total for a, a, for a crew complement of of five say or four whatever net the NASA mission is. So. Um, uh, so that's the kind of, we're looking on that kind of order. Now, could you take the trunk and fill it up with other gas bottles and make a, a long duration version? We probably could, but that, that's a, that'd be a separate development effort. It's be a long, close time together for five people uh, for, for a week. For more than a week, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean, uh, these spacecraft are all designed for a very specific purpose. You know, if, if you wanted something that, that could stay up there for 200 days, we'd build something that could, uh, but the, the, the design reference mission, if you will, is uh, to dock with the space station within, you know, 48 hours and then to undock and land within six. So I you can do the math and figure out, you know, what our vehicle's uh, built to do. Um, and then, as for, you know, for your other question, yeah, we got a way to take care of that stuff, too. Funny thing is, is nothing will probably happen before you get to space station anyway, so we plan to leave it all on space station. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see, we, we want to flip over to this side, if we can take the mic so over to the gentleman in the blue shirt here. So while we're doing that, I, I'll say one of the first jobs I had when I got out of college was um, to be part of the design team of the um, very first uh, space shuttle um, waste collection system. If you recall, it didn't work so well. <laughs> so I'm actually in a better job now. You're the guy. I, I'm, <laughs> <laughs> actually, it was my job to make sure that we met the electrical um, standards for grounding and that sort of thing. And I'm proud to say we didn't shock a single astronaut. Okay. <laughs> All right. Yes, go ahead, sir. Okay. Yeah, my question was, since it is crew, uh, uh, commercial crew and commercial cargo, 
it's a chance to cheer on each of your team. Uh, who's winning the cost game? I know your your <laughs> systems are not in full swing, but what what is each of your strengths? Like you can land on land, uh, you land in water. Is landing on land is it cut the cost drastically? Does water is that actually cut the cost? Uh, and cargo, uh, who's winning on the cargo side? Well, one thing I should clarify is we're we're landing on land as well. I didn't, oh. I didn't I didn't talk about it too much in my presentation, but our intention is for land landings as well. Oh, okay. Yeah. So uh, I don't think there's any differentiation there. Well, on, well, who's winning? I mean, on the cost, it's still who's pound for pound, we're cheaper. <laughs> the United States <laughs> taxpayers are the winners. <laughs> we don't want to get into any fights up here. No, no. We want fisticuffs to break out. Be ugly. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> No, we're, we're both equal. Uh, <laughs> we both have unique aspects where you know, SpaceX, in addition to pressurized cargo, has the return and unpressurized. Our focus is more on the pressurized. So we've got a larger pressurized volume, so pound per kilogram of pressurized, we're about equal or maybe a little better. And then we also have the capability of large trash disposal, which is also an important need for station. So we each have unique aspects that together make a good, good uh, support for station. And also, I wanted to, a second one for Reisman. Uh, on the when you add in that second, uh, the second burn, like turning it on, and NASA wants to go through each controlled structure. When you're adding in different variables, does that uh, add too many variables into it, causing uh, so you can't? They want you to go through step one, step two, step three. But if you're adding in those uh, restarts and reburns and doing a lot of experiments in that. Does that break the control of the experiment? Uh, no, 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 so, so maybe, I did, maybe I can explain a little better. The, the, um, when we restarted the second stage, it was something that wasn't required for that particular mission, which was not a NASA mission, by the way. The payload, uh, primary payload was a Canadian payload. It, it should have been uh, their hockey sticks, but unfortunately that, it was a satellite. Um, and uh, so we launched one of their satellites into low Earth orbit, and there was a couple other small sat sats that also deployed all successfully. So uh, on that particular uh, trajectory, there was no need to relight the second stage. We just knew that that was, but if you're going to do a geosynchronous transfer orbit, uh, then once you get into uh, orbit, it's kind of like for those, uh, there's a lot of people in here with shuttle heritage, it's kind of like um, a, uh, 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 you know, an uh, Ohm's one burn. So you're going to um, uh, relight the second stage halfway around and, and then boost yourself to a much higher orbit to deliver a, a, a geostationary satellite. That was required for the very next mission. So once the satellites were off uh, the vehicle, our customers didn't care what we did with the second stage okay. after that. And um, it was, the, but it was an opportunity for us to, to do this test. And we look for those opportunities wherever we can. Okay. Yeah. Whatever you can do to build confidence in the future always supports uh, the analysis downstream. So. Um, let's see, I, I saw, okay, how about here in the middle, um, gentleman in the black t-shirt, or polo here. Hi, this is a qu question for uh, Chris Ferguson. Um, I noticed one of the uh, potential landing sites was awfully close to Mexico. Are there any potential issues there if the spacecraft lands a little bit off and lands in Mexico? Is there any kind of negotiations with the government you're going to we'll have to, have to time. mount up the army and go back and get it I guess <laughs> um, no there, there's no um, water. we we didn't <laughs> <laughs> Garrett's on a roll <laughs> you know the reason we have a concentration of sites in, in the southern United States is because that's where a lot of the the idea the ideal geographical features are. You know, there's a lot of dry lake beds, there's a lot of desert down there. Uh, as far as, is there any complication with going to Mexico? I mean, we're, you know, our, our intent is to put this inside a real small circle. And uh, if you look at the way Apollo did it, I was just looking at some of the Apollo data the other day. You know, uh, aside from a few dispersions they had early on in the unmanned flights, you know, Apollo got it within a mile or two of their designated landing area every time. Uh, this is, I don't want to say it's, it's easy, it's certainly not easy, but it's, it's not very difficult uh, given an, an understood model to, to, to pinpoint something. So something anomalous would have to occur in order to have a part of uh, our spacecraft end up in Mexico. And you know, I, I would think uh, that international law would sort of take over at that point, you know, uh, 
just like we fly a U.S. airliner over Mexico, and if something happens, you know, we'll just take appropriate measures. Um, but there's there's no strategy of putting a lot of our landing sites within 40 miles of Mexico. Yeah, just leave it at that. Okay, thanks. All right, let's see. Um, well, Katie, would you like to ask a question? relieved when uh, Jim sat the three of you up there and then if he turned around and didn't face you then he might represent NASA and we'd be having the NASA dating game for commercial <laughs> crew. <laughs> Not that there's anything so wrong I, with it. I it was know. just a bad thought. Um, so, so here's my question. If you, if you could each say in a sentence or two, I mean NASA is trying to partner with you and, and try to keep people from reinventing the wheel and yet when, when Garrett was outlining what the final administrative contracting kind of thing looks like and how it's going to be much the same as what we have, that's disappointing to me, right? Where there, is, there could be a lot of layers and a lot of checking. And, and so, you know, you do bring so much flexibility. What is it that NASA could do for you to make, I mean, I think we're all on the same mission. We all have the same passion. What could NASA do for you to make life easier so we could get to the goal? Wow. In a few sentences, <laughs> few, few. This is being it might all be the guys. same thing, and then you'd realize you're all on the same team. <laughs> sure, I'll start. What the heck? Um, first, let me say that that there is an enormous amount of assistance that we get from NASA. Assistance is probably I. Um, <laughs> it's probably is, is not the good? right word to use. Uh, we have a lot of guidance. Uh, there is uh, the commercial cr program, okay, which is headquartered in Florida has, um, they have liaisons that, that work with each of the commercial partners. And while we don't get any direction from them, you know, it, we do, uh, th they're there, they look into our operation, they understand what we're doing, we ask them the questions, they give us answers. So that has worked very, very well. Um, if I had to say what could we do a little bit better, um, right now uh, the commercial crew program, which is a fairly new entity, and the, uh, and the what I, what I think is really the prime customer of the International Space Station, um, there's, a, there's a lot more discussion that can take place between those two organizations. Um, case in point is uh, we're getting ready to do another series of safety reviews. Uh, safety reviews are very important. Uh, we, we finished a series very recently with the ISS program. Now we're going through the very, very similar review with the commercial crew program. Uh, and I think that there's some growing pains and we'll eventually figure our way to get through this. Uh, but we, we do find that there's a little bit of, you know, uh, who's in charge. And I think if we sort of line that up a little bit, it would, uh, it would eliminate the need for some redundancies that are taking place. And I think that they realize that, and, and we're, we're going to work towards an equitable solution. Yep. Uh, what he said. <laughs> uh, yeah, I know another review process you're talking about. We're, we're part of the same process, and that's, that's definitely a valid uh, point. Um, I would, I would say that, uh, first of all, I have to acknowledge that uh, we would not be anywhere near where we are today without our partnership with NASA. We would, we would not have had all the, all the success we had. We, we never would have gotten dragging up to ISS. We, we, you know, there's, there's a lot of, we made a lot of rapid progress that without N NASA's partnership would not have happened. So, so we have a big, we're in na a big debt. Now, if I, if I want to nitpick and say what could be better, um, I would say that it, it's human nature to, when you're doing something new, to model it on what you've done before. Uh, because we all take our experiences into any new endeavor, and, and that's, just, that's just natural. You have to have some, some basis to go on. Um, so, but sometimes that, that, that old way, the way you did things before might not apply to this new situation. And uh, when and that's ha that happens. So there's things uh, in uh, the requirements. There's things in the, um, some of the documents and in the in the in in, in the uh, uh, in the in the RFP uh, that are things that make a lot of sense in a very traditional uh, program that I don't th I think don't really make sense or don't add a lot of value at least in in this new way of doing business. So when we do point those things out and when we do try to do something different, the burden of proof. It's always, on the, on, uh, you know, at the working level on the NASA side, I think it, it's um, the, the easiest thing to do is to do what you've always done because it, it doesn't entail taking any risk. 
Um, so when, when we ask them to do something different, the burden of proof is always on the person trying to innovate. And, and I wish it was, that, it, but there's no other way to do that. If you do something the same way it's always been done, it's easy to say yes because you, you have that experience. And, and if you do something different, you gotta learn a, about that new way and is it good? Is it better or is it worse? So I don't see any easy solution around that, but it is, it is frustrating sometimes that, um, that there's a, there's, a, uh, there's a steep hill to climb when you wanna do something new. If I could just chime in too before um, Jeff um, offers his comments, because I, I really think there's a lot to be uh, said about the success of the cargo program as a leading edge for um, trying to uh, do commercial crew. And um, one of the things I've seen uh, from my vantage point within the agency, uh, within NASA, is the desire to try and find new ways to do things and still maintain the same level of risk tolerance. And that's been the stress that, that we've been under, especially on, um, uh, on, the, um, on the expendable robotic launch vehicle side, NASA's launch services program, um, trying very hard to, to adapt to a commercial model because we know it will save us money. And yet at the same time, not yet ready to let go of the whole uh, risk profile that says if I do everything down to this last detail, whether it's necessary or not, I know that I'm keeping my risk, um, uh, my, my risk tolerance um, very, very high. So I'm using the wrong, it's probably risk tolerance is very low. Anyway, the bottom line is that we're, we're dealing with the, with the tension between risk and the desire to do things much more efficient, efficiently within our agency. And, in, at, and I believe that the cargo program actually was an opportunity to try something uh, radically different. And I, I hope you guys would say it was a success. I, I hope we were managed, managed to keep our fingers out of it um, to the degree that you could do it successfully. Sure, and, you, and you've seen the success from both our companies here recently in supplying cargo to station. I, I was going to just... Uh, kind of build on what Garrett said. We've, we've been through what Garrett kind of described in the early days of the cargo design process, where we, we first started and got together. Orbital had a way of doing things and had a way of wanting to keep costs or make the business case or, or do things a certain way. And NASA was coming in with some of the old way of thinking of how they'd done things in the past. Um, but the commercial cargo model was a little different in that Orbital had the final say. You know, NASA would levy the requirements if we showed a way we can meet that requirement, you know, it was our call to make that decision. Now, NASA was a good partner, and they would advise us to say, well, have you thought about this? You know, we had this experience on this other vehicle. Uh, have you thought, you know, and offering all those kind of suggestions. So over time, it became a real working partnership where uh, we learned from NASA what was best to accommodate, but still meet the requirements, make them comfortable that we could apply what they want us to do to, to be safe, uh, get through the safety route process, and then get to station. So it was a good learning experience on both sides. Right. Let's see. We saw, I saw some questions here in the middle. How about uh, you in the white shirt here? Oh, did I skip you? I want to ask a question for you. Oh, you want to? You got to? At the end. Sure, go ahead. While well, we're passing the mic Why here. At the end? <laughs> hey, so I'm, I'm really interested. You know, uh, Antares, really cool. But, you know, it's um, very... I don't think it's ever been done where you build a, a, a launcher that's got a finite end date to it. You know, like you can't go beyond this point in its current configuration. What's next for Antares after the, after the engine thing? Uh, well, I'm not sure I can go into much detail <laughs> 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 and those kind of thoughts. Um, <laughs> but right now we're focused on. Well, let me give you my card. <laughs> 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 There's okay. always the, the Antares heavy, you know, with lap putting three of them together and those kind of things. But those are still on the drawing board, so we haven't really come forward with any other alter alternations right now. But for now, it's working for you. Uh, let's see. Yeah, we passed the mic here. This is a question for uh, Jeff and Garrett. You both have uh, CRS missions now under your belts. Um, curious, now that station's going to be around perhaps to 2024 or later, there's going to need to be another round of uh, CRS contracts. If you have any sort of lessons learned from these initial missions in terms of technology, procedures, contractual issues, you'd like to see applied to a, a next round of uh, CRS awards? 
That's a good question. Mm -hmm. What would you do different? On, on the technical side, I think we've learned um, a lot of lessons about the vehicle, and 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 um, we're incorporating a lot of those into our new crew vehicle. So I think I think there's good technical lessons that uh, that have come out of our our operations, and we've 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 learned uh, other things process wise along the way, and we we keep trying to get better um, on all these things. As far as on a contracting mechanism, I think. Um, in the relationship with NASA, I think that the FAR 12 commercial contracting um, that we have in place for the CRS program, I think, is working very well. And and I, I would I, I certainly uh, um, it's it's it, the FAR for those of you that that uh, believe me, I didn't know what I thought FAR was Federal Aviation Regulations back when I <laughs> was in the astronaut office, but but it's uh, the Federal Acquisition Regulations now, and um, there's different parts and and what we're CCT cap is. Uh, I think a FAR Part 15, so that's very different from a FAR Part 12, which is much more like a, sh it's a much more streamlined, much more like a commercial contract, and and I think it makes sense, but it only works when you have uh, a commercially available service, and since there's two of us that both av are available and publish our prices, then it works, and I think uh, hopefully for crew, uh, when we get to the services phase, after TCAP is over, and hopefully, and, and again, that's why it's really important to maintain competition, so you can have the same situation. I, I'd like to see NASA use that same FAR Part 12 commercial contract for servicing missions um, after TCAP is over. Yeah, I, I'd agree. The contract mechanism has worked fine, and we'd see that continuing as, as no problem. On a technical side, um, there are things we're looking at. We've, we've got a baseline vehicle that works. Um, the system's been tested. We're looking at maybe other ways to expand the capabilities of Cygnus to do other things. Uh, right now, we're uh, prop limited to do a lot of free flight. We could, after we undock from station, we could stay in orbit for, I don't know, six, seven months. But if we had something like articulating arrays, like uh, SpaceX, yeah, we could extend that to a year or more. So there's some technology things we're looking at doing to enhance the capabilities for Cygnus in the future. Awesome. Let's see, we had uh, a question in the back. Uh, it's almost straight back. Hi. Um, my question is for actually all three of you all. Um, you're, you're, you're okay. Yeah. Um, so all three of you use, I, w I don't know if I would want to call it the standard method of, you know, getting cargo, crew, what have you, up to space. Um, basically rocket with capsule, rather that's carrying crew or cargo. And I know with that you have components like the service module, the various stages that you can't really reuse. I know SpaceX is doing some work in trying to get some of those stages back, but I just want to know what uh, each of the companies are trying to do to kind of enhance the reusability of their uh, their spacecraft, maybe some technologies down the road, or, you know, if you care to share, if that's like locked up somewhere. Well, let me take a shot, let's see. Uh, reusability. Um, the one aspect of reusability, uh, we had some discussions with Langley <clears throat> who wanted to test out a, um, a HIAD system, which is the inflatable decelerator, and put that around a Cygnus and bring that back. Um, I'm not sure how reusable it would be after that kind of entry, but that was something we were starting to look at as a potential reusability aspect of Cygnus. Otherwise, it's really designed for its one mission and to burn up all the trash, which is a real, real need from station. Um, so yeah, reusability, my, my boss hates throwing things away. He can't stand it when, and, and um, so he keeps pushing us to, to make things. He he, he doesn't even. He, he, he if he was if he, if there was a, if the laws of physics would allow it, he'd love to get rid of the parachutes because like he says, how many times do you see a Boeing 747 land and and deploy parachutes and then have to you know that wouldn't really work in the commercial model. So, um, so so we're, we're, the first step is is getting the first stage back, and we're working really hard on that and. In fact, we came awfully close to it on the very first try, which was the, that first launch out of Vandenberg. Um, and, uh, and, and so we're going to keep working on perfecting that. We hope that um, within a year, we hope to have the first, uh, first stage come back and land on land uh, and, then, and then be able to reuse first stages, which will be a real game changer in the, in the cost of, of uh, all of our missions. And um, he would even like to get back to the second stage. That's much harder. And uh, we've been ta we've been working on that, but it's all on the drawing board right now. We haven't gotten to the point where you could try even try a demonstration. And um, and then Dragon, we we like to eventually make reusable as well. 
we'll never get the the trunk back. The trunk is always uh, going to be left on orbit, but but the capsule we want to reuse that. So um, I had mentioned we want to reuse the upper part, the the crew module part of our spacecraft, uh, several times, and uh, so. Th the way to get, gain maximum efficiency out of this, put all the important things in there, you know, all the things that you can, um, that you don't want to throw away, put them all in there. So, I mean, it, it, there is an engineering challenge. We clearly have to throw away our service module uh, every time. But, uh, but another thing, you know, and it looks like we've reached common ground here, coming back to land is a big deal. You know, you, you put something in the water and you, you, your, re your reusability of that thing you put in the water becomes highly suspect at that point. So, uh, yeah, you know, bring it back to land, put all the important things, all the expensive things uh, that you get back and you use over and over again. Y you know, when we get ready to discard our service module, it really will just be nothing but, a, but a, an empty shell full of uh, mostly empty fuel tanks. Mm -hmm. I think we'll take one more question, and then I have a couple of comments to wrap up the evening. Let's see. Um, yeah, okay, here we go. Yeah. Well, we're looking. Coming up on <laughs> U.S. dollars, greenbacks. All right. Um, my question for for the panel up here is: is uh, as we all know, uh, space flight's challenging, and and you've all, have, I'm sure, overcome some challenges along the way. But what what challenge have you overcome in the design phase that you you would say is maybe the most rewarding? Please don't say NASA. Don't say the FAA. <laughs> I'll get it started while we're all thinking. Um, big picture, let, let me talk about uh, just sort of the day-to-day. -day. And, and this, is, this is a new experience for me. I've been an operator all my life, and then to go over and work on a program like this, it's been a, real, it's a, been a very rewarding experience. First of all, I'm amazed at the depth at which, uh, you know, a lot of the folks, and it's not just Boeing. I mean, there's a lot of, a lot of young talent in, in, this, uh, you know, in this business that have really creative ways of doing things. And uh, I was amazed at the decision velocity when I first showed up over there. I mean, I, I think my very first, you know, engineering board that I went in, we, we had decided to, you know, discard a major component with the stroke of a, not even a pin. It was just, you know, the chief engineer said, no, we, we can't do it. And I thought, wow, you know, if, if back in my previous life, we would debate that for a half a decade and then decide to do nothing. Um, so, so uh, I, I was absolutely amazed with the decision velocity. And, you know, designing a, a spacecraft like this is playing whack-a-mole. You know, as something pops out and you whack it back down. And when you whack that thing back down, something else pops out. So, I mean, it's all just a giant jigsaw puzzle to get the power, to get the thermal, to get the, you know, the, the, the mission duration, to get, you know, everything in the box at just the right time. And then you sort of tie it up in a bow and you step away and you hope it doesn't spring open on you. Um, but I'm, I'm sort of answering your question in a roundabout way. It's fun to watch the sausage being made is what I, what I really want to say. Um, we, um, uh, you know, we, we got sort of thrown a bit of a curveball about, uh, I don't know, a year and a half ago, and NASA came back and said, hey, I know you've designed your vehicle a certain way, but we want to add another day of, un of undocked deorbit capability to your schedule. Okay, uh, you know, for some that may have articulating solar arrays, that would not a huge challenge. You know, we weren't in that category. So uh, we had to get really creative, and it took a while to beat that thing back into a box. But, uh, you know, we, through a combination of power saving, getting a more efficient, you know, battery uh, assembly, and, uh, you know, I mentioned we have a solar array now. Uh, you know, it was just a just engineering feat of pulling it all together. So I, and I can't speak for the rest of the team. And we've done a lot of really cool stuff to come up with innovative ways to fix things, but that's probably the one that comes out and sticks out in my mind. So while you pass the mic to Garrett, I'll just say, if it weren't for problems, engineers wouldn't have jobs. Right. Yeah, I'm going to say basically the same thing uh, because I'm, uh, so my job now is to manage the program uh, and so I'm supposed to, my, my, my primary job is uh, dealing with costs and schedules and uh, working, um, uh, you know, management issues and, and working with NASA and um, writing proposals, <laughs> stuff, fun stuff like that. But what I really enjoy doing um, is being a backseat uh, we, uh, kind of chief engineer and um, and dealing with all the technical issues and our, our technical lead uh, probably is, is, is had enough of me um, uh, jumping up in his meetings and and uh, and giving direction but uh, but it's fun it's so much fun uh, and um, uh, so so that part of it is, has been the most exciting for me and, and helping design especially things that I have a, 
uh, a background in helping design suits and 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 displays and controls and um, but also I, th I would think along the way that probably the most interesting challenge was getting the um, abort conops to work for all points in the trajectory with no black zones uh, uh, finding a way to to overcome all the GNC challenges all the prop challenges all the uh, environments challenges um, and uh, that uh, that wasn't easy and and boy we were we went back and forth all over the place all different kinds of designs and and uh, and and challenges that looked almost insurmountable at first, but we found a way, and uh, that was hugely rewarding. Awesome. I guess from a Cygnus perspective, uh, Orbital had a lot of experience in spacecraft design, so we had the the knowledge for for thrusters and comm systems and things like that. I guess the the main challenge uh, it was nice to see it come together is the whole integrated software architecture approach. You know, having all the systems tied together with fault detection logic. Uh, and then seeing that execute real time and work, um, even though we did all the ground testing in Monte Carlos and everything to make everything you know feel comfortable, but actually seeing it fly and and be success, that was our probably main main thing in the design process. Great. Well, um, thank you for coming this evening. Uh, before you leave, we have a couple of announcements, but let's give our panelists a round of applause. Thank you. So um, if you're wondering why we're here, we're associated with an annual conference called Space Up. It's really an unconference, and we'd encourage you to come back tomorrow. Uh, at what time, Tristan? The unconference begins at 10 a.m. 10 a.m. Um, oh, go ahead. And it runs all day, and we feed you lunch and dinner. Uh, and they feed you lunch and dinner. It's right here in this building, and it's, a, it's an opportunity to talk about space, about anything you'd like to talk about in space with people that are advocates and interested in the same sorts of topics. Um, I would also say that tomorrow evening, if you come back at this same time, there will be a, uh, another panel, and this one is going to be focusing on space tourism. And so Kaki Rodway from XCOR will be here. Um, Faith Villes, I believe is her name, from the Planetary Science Institute will be here. And the third panelist is, I gotta look it up real fast, Mike Machula from the FAA will, oh, will, will be here. Yeah, actually we're gonna nail him in his seat. So, um, yeah, he'll still be here. <laughs> Can't get enough. Anyway, c come on back because what, what's really happening, in, in my opinion, and this is my humble opinion, is that NASA is pushing the bounds of, the hum of humans into space. And what comes behind us to fill the space that we leave behind us is commercial enterprise. And what will follow behind them will be, the, um, will, will be entertainment, space tourism and industry. And so I, I really think that we're, you're in an age where you're beginning to see destinations open up to regular people um, and, and not simply those of governments. And, and this is a fantastic time to be watching the space industry. Um, did I, do we have any more announcements from our organizers? Did I hit everything? Thank you everybody for coming and hopefully we'll see you tomorrow. All right.